Advanced Holding Patterns with Chris Pazala. Welcome. This is Carl Vlaer with ExpertAviator.com, and we have a really interesting presentation today. Welcome to Expert Aviator, Chris. Thank you for having me, Carl. And today we're going to have a conversation about holding patterns. You know, you, you probably thought you knew holding patterns, but you know, Chris is going to make us understand them, but also he's going to help us use them as a tool while we're flying. You know, today is this presentation. We're going to have a certain content here that you're, you're going to learn some really good stuff. So I'm really excited about this, Chris. In today's presentation, we're going to, we're going to learn. We're going to, first, we're going to review the basics, of course. The next thing we're going to do is go over wind correction and timing, myths and common mistakes, high wind situations, dealing with disorientation, entry procedures, and examples of published holds. Well, Chris, what is holding? Well, Carl, uh, holding uh, is a concept where aircraft uh, stay in one area uh, while they are waiting for a, a point in time to elapse. And uh, it's used for different purposes. Um, the most common that airline passengers are familiar with is the weather's bad or there's some other reason that we can't land at the airport we're going to. But we also see holding patterns being used in other circumstances, uh, such as aircraft that are trying to climb in high elevation or an aircraft that's reached its clearance limit. Uh, we also see them in use a lot with GPS approaches these days. So let's talk a little bit more about the holding pattern and also the, the segments of the hold. What, what are these different segments of the hold? I know I've always heard about the, the entry and the inbound and the outbound leg. Take, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, certainly. We'll do a run through here of the uh, basic components. Uh, with the chart here, uh, the triangle is the holding fix. And the holding fix is the one firm point in the holding pattern. It's the point that we're going to come back to in every rotation. Uh, and this is the point that uh, would be designated by air traffic control or by a chart. Then we're going to have, uh, obviously, two turns in two straight segments. So anytime we're turning away from the holding fix, we've crossed over it, we're on the outbound turn. Anytime that we're flying straight and we're more or less moving away from it is the outbound leg. And then we we'll make a turn back towards the holding fix. That's going to be the inbound turn, which is followed by the inbound leg. And the inbound leg always ends at the holding fix. The inbound leg ends at the holding fix. Okay, so now, now I understand that. But uh, how about explaining, first of all, the, the simple... A no wind pattern. Uh, I know it's a total of four minutes, and uh, how is it broken down? Well, the uh, the no wind pattern sometimes we hear it referred to as a one minute, sometimes a four. Uh, that's because each leg by itself is one minute, and you're going to have four legs. So again, we're going to have a holding fix represented here by the triangle, an outbound turn, an inbound turn, and the two straight legs. Now, when we look at the chart or any drawing of this, the turns look really short, and we get this impression that we're not spending a lot of time turning. But actually, we're going to be doing 280 degree, one, two turns of 180 degrees. Each one is going to take one minute. That means we're spending two minutes of our four-minute pattern making turns. So half of our pattern is going to be turning here. So you're spending a lot of time uh, making turns sort of throughout this pattern, assuming, of course, that there's no wind. Once the wind gets involved, it gets a little bit uh, different as far as the timing goes. So let's go ahead and take a look at um, what we actually do with this information, right? Because, you know, we're in the real world. We have wind... Uh, pretty much every day. So how does wind affect our holding pattern? Uh, with this one here, uh, you're going to see an example of a pilot that's trying to fly a pattern. He was hoping to go straight up, make a turn come straight down, and then go around the pattern again. But he's made no wind correction, and the wind here is from the right. So this aircraft is getting pushed to the left all the way through this pattern. It's sort of interesting to note that this is a four-minute pattern. If we made no wind correction for four minutes, with just as much as 15 knots of wind, we're going to be an entire mile off course after that four minutes. And in instrument conditions, it's not uncommon to see 30 knots of wind, so we could be as much as two miles off course. That sounds like quite a bit off course there, just after a couple of minutes. And uh, I guess later on we'll talk a little bit about this. I was always taught uh, in the beginning that, boy, this could blow you into the unprotected side of the holding pattern. So we'll, this, is a, this is a little teaser for something coming up soon. Uh, definitely, and we'll definitely be talking about uh, what kind of airspace we have uh, when we're working with holding patterns. So one of the ways to stay within the required airspace is to fly the pattern properly. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example here where we didn't get it quite right. This is going to be my fictitious pilot named Tom, and Tom's generally a good pilot, but he doesn't understand holding. So in this case, he flew outbound with no wind correction. Maybe he didn't know what the wind was, or maybe he just didn't care. Either way, You'll notice here, as he tries to fly back inbound, he's making a large correction to the right. He's correcting not only for the wind he's incurring now, but all that wind that pushed him off to what was his right on his way out. 
So the question, of course, is how do we fix this? What do we do next here? Well, we know the wind correction didn't work, so let's try a crab angle. For those of you who have done cross countries, you know that a crab angle is when you angle into the wind so that you can get a track that matches what you're looking for. Here in example number two, Tom's figured out the wind. So he's gone ahead and he's made a correction on the outbound, and he's made a correction on the inbound. So he's got two nice straight legs, but he still didn't end up where he wanted to be. So Carl, what happened here? Well, it looks like he, he put in the right wind correction to have a straight line, but, but he's been blown off course. Yep, and so he's still getting blown off course. And so where this is happening is on the turns. Because as remember, this pattern is four minutes, half the time spent turning, the wind doesn't stop just because the airplane is making a turn. We're still being pushed. So how do I, I mean, this, this makes sense to do the pattern this way intuitively. How do I fix this? Uh, great question, Carl. So we'll go ahead and take a look at uh, example number three. And with example number three, you'll notice that the inbound leg straight, the corners are still getting pushed. But on the outbound leg, the pilot's doing something interesting. He's flying towards the wind. Not only is he correcting for that drift, he's flying further towards the wind. He's getting upstream. And the reason he's doing that is so that he can allow the plane to be pushed in the turns. Um, you know, a lot of times when I do seminars, people suggest, well, you could just increase or decrease your rate of turn. Uh, but the problem with doing that is that there's no good way to know how much to increase or decrease your bank, and you could end up in an overbank situation. So when we do uh, wind corrections laterally, we want to make sure that we're still using three degrees per second uh, in each of the turns, and then we're going to use the outbound. So um, some people like to use what's called double correction. Some use triple. Uh, the FAA recommends triple, which is what I use. So the aircraft in example number three here, he's going to be, if he needs five degrees of right correction going towards the fix, he needs 15 on the outbound. That extra uh, 10 degrees is going to carry him into the wind. And you'll notice that it was five degrees to the right inbound. It's 15 to the left outbound because when he turned around, the wind's on his other side. The other example, uh, which is number four, is the same situation except that the wind's on the other side. And you'll notice inbound again, we have a straight leg. And then on the outbound leg, he's again moving towards the wind. And so this egg shape is actually what we're looking for. So in both instances where the winds from either direction, one blowing you maybe towards a fix, one away from the fix, you're still going to triple the correction that you had on the inbound leg. Exactly. So uh, suppose that uh, north is at the top of the chart here uh, in the example on the right. Uh, that aircraft uh, is going to be using five degrees of correction to his left as he goes north and he's using 15 to his right. And so it doesn't matter whether it's left or right. It's going to be towards the wind that we want to be making that additional correction. But gosh, you know, how do I, how do I figure this out? I guess I'd have to fly the inbound leg first to, to start figuring this out, wouldn't I? Uh, the traditional method, uh, especially for, for folks like me that learned to fly before GPS was popular in general aviation, uh, is just to go out and fly it. And it looks a lot like example number one, where we just fly the headings, and then on the inbound leg, we start to figure out, okay, how much correction do we need? Uh, the great thing today is that we've got technology available that makes this easier. Uh, we've got wind vectors that show up in glass cockpits. Uh, we've got winds aloft forecasts. Uh, and we've got pilot reports uh, from other pilots. Uh, so this is all information we can use uh, to take an estimate on the first go. Uh, the biggest mistake we see, though, is that even when people know the wind, they don't make enough correction. Uh, if you have an aircraft that's holding at, say, 100 knots, and you have a 20-knot crosswind, that's 20% of your speed. That's a huge effect that that's going to have on your aircraft. So if you're going to be you know, 20 knot crosswind, you might have to start with 10, 15, 20 degrees of correction on that first outbound. And you know, don't be afraid to take a stab at, at that outbound correction if you already know what the wind is. If you know that wind is going to be from, let's see in the right example here, uh, going to be from your right as you're on your outbound leg, go ahead and make that extra correction towards the wind. And even if you're off a little, you won't be off by that much. So if you basically think you have to make, say, a five-degree correction, then instead of that, make it 15 degrees? Exactly. Uh, you know, if you think it's going to be five inbound here, then make 15 on the outbound. And it's okay to overcorrect because if you overcorrect, you're going to end up upwind. And it's much easier to fix being upwind than being downwind. Interesting. Great. This is great stuff. Now, something else besides wind correction that always confuses myself and also especially my students because is going and timing these legs. Is there is there some some way that I can figure out how to time? Because I know you were just talking about each of these as one minute. Well, where do I start my clock? Uh, very good question. Uh, the, the FAA's goal and what the FAA is looking for uh, is to have a one-minute inbound. So from the point at which we roll wings level or cross that 
inbound course, whichever happens first, uh, to the point that we get to the holding fix, uh, we want to have one minute. And we want to have a minute so that we have enough time to make any lateral adjustments that we need to. Uh, anything less than a minute wouldn't give us really what we need. Um, the problem, though, is if we're going to do one minute inbound, how do we get to that? Uh, if there's no wind, then what we're going to do is go ahead and make our turn outbound. We can start timing as soon as we are a beam, which means across from the holding fix. And then when we get to one minute, stop the timer, make it turn inbound. No wind, this should automatically work. So the question becomes, what do we do if we start to encounter wind? And so with this uh, first example here, we have an aircraft that did not know what the wind was. He crossed over the holding fix. He went outbound for one minute. He started his time a beam right across from the holding fix. He finished his time after one minute, he turned inbound. It took one minute to turn inbound. And then as he starts to fly back to the fix, it takes him a minute and 10 seconds. But as we know, the FAA is looking for one minute inbound. So we have to make an adjustment here. And the recommended procedure, and the one that I use, is to adjust the outbound timing. So we're actually going to adjust the outbound timing to fix our inbound timing. So when we move to the center example here, this is the same one, same wind. And what we've done is we've taken 10 seconds away from that outbound leg. And by removing that 10 seconds of flying outbound, we are adjusting the inbound leg as well. So the inbound leg becomes one minute. So again, with the center example, we're going to turn outbound, start our timing of beam the fix, fly 50 seconds in this case, make a turn inbound, and then that turn inbound, again, we're going to start our timing whenever we cross the inbound course or we roll to wings level. In a perfect world, those will happen together. Real life, it, not always the case. So once one of those two things happens, we'll start our timing inbound. Now, what if the wind's from the other direction? Uh, that's the same problem, but we do it in the opposite direction. Uh, with the example on the right here, um, I've already made the correction. So this pilot's already gone around once and figured out what the wind is and made his adjustment. He's flying a minute 10 outbound and then achieving a one minute inbound. So uh, what you need to do, regardless of which scenario you run into, is to look at how much time did it take me to fly inbound and then adjust the outbound. And so if you're too much time going in, take time off the outbound. If you're not enough time going in, it's getting short on you, then you want to add time. Now, let's go back to timing again. Something that I think confuses myself is when I actually start my timer again. Uh, if I'm timing the outbound leg, when do I actually hit the timer? When does that happen? Um, there's been a huge amount of confusion about this. Uh, some of the major flight schools have put out some documents that uh, weren't fully up to date. So this uh, graph we're looking at here is from the Aeronautical Information Manual. This is 2013, but it's, uh, it remains the same today as well. Uh, the beam point is going to be 90 degrees across your holding pattern, which is straight across from your holding fix. What they say is that this is where the FAA wants you to start. So if you're doing a VOR hold, you're going to see uh, the flag, the to from flag will flip from a from indication to a to indication. Uh, a GPS on an OBS mode will do the same. Um, so will a lot of the database modes for the GPS holding. The only time that we would do anything different is if we can't identify that beam point. If we can't identify the beam point, then they say, well, roll wings level and start the timer. So cases where you would not be able to figure out when you're a beam would be a dual VOR hold, uh, some types of VOR DME holds, other sort of um, less used holding patterns will sometimes run into that issue. Uh, a lot of that, of course, today can be resolved with GPS. The other issue with this uh, paragraph here is it says timing begins over or a beam. Does that seem confusing, Carl? Over? Why would I be over the fix? It's a great question. That's because this paragraph applies not only to being in the pattern, but during your entry as well. So when you first do your entry, whether it's a teardrop, a parallel, uh, you're going to cross over the holding fix. And in that, those scenarios, you want to start the timing over the fix. But that over part really only applies to the entry. Once you're in, it's just going to be starting the outbound timing uh, when you're a beam. Oh, so I see. When I'm actually entering this hold and I go over the fix, that's when I start my outbound. So that, that makes sense now. I'm glad you, you pointed that out. You know, when we're doing these holding patterns, there's a lot of information that controller gives us. And uh, it's kind of it's hard to remember that, I think. Uh, do you make any recommendations as to what to write down? Uh, absolutely. Uh, it's just like our taxi instructions or our pre-departure clearance. Uh, we're going to want to write those down. And uh, all the information here is, is excellent. Uh, the red parts are certainly the most critical. And we want to write down, first of all, the holding instructions. So they're going to give us uh, information about where the hold is and how we're going to perform the hold. Uh, we'll go a little more into detail about that later. 
And then the other information is not necessarily information we're getting from air traffic control, but we want to write down information such as our inbound and outbound headings. We want any notes that will help us perform this holding pattern. Uh, so depending on the type of entry you have or the type of holding pattern, it, some of this information could be different. For instance, if you had a hold at, say, a VOR, north of VOR, you're holding on the 360 radial, but you're going to have an inbound heading of 180. That gets really confusing. So if you've already written down their instructions and then figured out what kind of turns you're going to make and what directions you're going to fly, that's going to make it a lot easier when you actually go to fly it. One of the other things I see uh, with students a lot is that they're trying to fly and the controller always calls it the worst possible minute. Matter of fact, it's intentional. It's, it's part of how they get even with us as pilots. No, I kid. <laughs> but uh, but they, they do sometimes call when you're busy. So uh, one thing you can do is you can say, um, you know, please stand by for readback, meaning I wrote down what you said, but I haven't had a chance to read it back to you yet. So always aviate, navigate, and communicate in that order. So this is ending part number one here of Advanced Guide to Holding Patterns. If you want to learn more about how to actually purchase the rest of this course, go to expertaviator.com and look at the tab that says Advanced Guide to Holding Patterns. We will have actually more information on Advanced Guide to Holding Patterns there and more videos at expertaviator.com and also youtube.com slash expertaviator.